going to use the Zoom built-in polling functionality. So each, um, each item that, we, that comes to a vote, um, there will be a poll question that will pop up automatically on your screen. And there's one quirk to this, you know, we have, um, you know, many households may have more than one voting member joining through the same video. So the question will be posed multiple times and please vote only once per person. So, you know, if there is one person, just answer um, yay, nay, or abstain for yourself. And if there's a second person sharing the same device, um, then that person will answer um, second. And I think the, it's, there's, there are slots for at least three people, um, which I think will cover, um, cover everyone. Uh, Monica, do we have, do we need to pause for people joining by audio only? Do we need to call on people for audio votes? Yeah, that's the only way that we'll be able to know what they're voting. So after we've done the poll or even while we're doing the poll, if we can, um, if you're on the phone, unmute yourself and just say what you're voting. Okay. Yay, nay, abstain. Perfect, thank you. Yes, and I believe the poll will pop up automatically when we get there. So we'll have a chance to practice this in a minute where we're, we, are, uh, uh, we are approving the minutes from the last meeting. So we'll, we'll see how it works in just a minute. Okay, I think that's it. All right, so uh, if everyone has had a chance to take a look at the minutes from the last parish meeting in May of 2020, um, that is, um, oh, one, one more, just one more item about, um, about the meeting. Um, uh, I know there's a lot of activity already in chat. So, so at any time during the meeting, please place questions in chat. Um, you know, depending on what the topic is, we may or may not be able to address it right now. Um, but uh, board members and Monica are monitoring the chat. And if we don't have time to get to something, we will um, come back another way in writing later. All right, so there is a motion um, on, the, on the deck to approve the minutes from the last parish meeting. Are there any questions or corrections? You can unmute yourself or... Uh, or no to any questions in the chat. All right, uh, if there are no questions or additions, we can move to the poll. Terry, do you want to mention it, the, the multiple options there? Yes, um, I, yeah, I did. So, so just need to vote once per member. So there's a, there's a second and third option if there's more than one voting member. It uh, won't let me, sub it won't let me submit without answering all three questions. Yeah, I, I click on submit and nothing happens. Should click mm. abstain for the other ones. We just clicked on close. Maybe we didn't get. Maybe it didn't get registered then. I didn't, I didn't see the submit thing. Let's see. We see twenty-two people. Thirty-five percent is voted. Do, Monica, does it work if we click on abstain for the ones that? Yes. yes. I wonder. Yeah. That's yes, it does. Do. Yes, that works. Yep. Thank you. That, and what I if mean, we just close it? What if we just no, close it? No, that won't work. Closing it oh. gets rid of it entirely. Okay, okay, I did not see the submit. You have to go all the way. You scroll down to get to the submit button. Yes, and it doesn't allow you to. It doesn't turn blue and call your attention to it until you've uh, done something with the, the other, with all three. And I tried the abstain and it worked just fine. Thanks everybody. So yeah, it must be requiring the other two to be answered as well. So if you could hit abstain on number two and number three, um, we'll just assume that 
the vast majority of the abstains from two and three are from you all trying to get through the poll. And we'll try to figure out, um, we'll try to figure out for next time. Thanks for your patience. Trying something new. <laughs> I'll just give it a couple of minutes. It shows uh, the percentage who have voted so far. For next time, you could add a fourth option, not applicable, and that would not muddy up the abstentions. Yes. Yeah. Yep, exactly. That's what we're thinking. Monica, mine disappeared on me. I am wondering, folks, at the bottom of your screen, there is a button that says polling. Do you all see that or no? Oh. No. No. No? No. I don't know how you get the poll back if it closed on you. No. Kelly, I think you have some extra privileges because you're a co-host. Okay. That's why you can see polling. How many of you, um, so I see Lori, how many of you were not able to vote? I have a suggestion. I can see that 66 people said yay to the first question, 3% abstained. And the second question, 19, I'm sorry, not percent, 66 people said yay. And the second question, 19 said yay. Um, in other words, we have more than a quorum that's voted. Um, so I think if everyone's okay, you could raise your hand if you really wanna make sure that you have, um, that your vote is seen. Um, but otherwise let's, Terry, try to move forward and um, assume that this has been passed. What do you think? Uh, Monica, can I vote verbally? Absolutely. Yep. Raise your hands or, or vote verbally. Um, I vote verbally. Okay. So, John. Honey, you want to do yours? Oh, John. Cindy Graham. Claire Box. Um, Ann Reifenberg. Yes. Rachel Avery. Jackie. I could see me. Okay. This is Dick Goldberg and Liza Monroe. We vote yes. <laughs> Rachel, okay. Yeah, so I think we just need, you know, if anyone hasn't already um, gotten the poll to work, um, you know, we just need a consensus. Um, You're not close. We'll on the precision of this um, for future meetings. Put in progress. Vote is there in anyone? audio only that we need to needs to chime in there's not the switch to gallery either oops yeah can we switch to gallery oh. okay i think we have an overwhelming um majority uh i, I see no nays on the polls so i think we have uh, uh we've accepted our minutes by consensus this is going to go on to 7 p.m all right Okay. Yeah, please, um, please mute everyone if you're um, if you're not intentionally speaking. All right. Chad is also available if you have any um, anything to bring forward. Um, so we are our next item. If we could share the um, share the screen again. Terry, do you mind terribly? I'm going to try to fix the poll for number two. So if if we could refer to the agenda for just a minute, uh, I think I can. I think I can make this work for the next one. All right, <laughs> good practice for our uh, <laughs> for our next uh, for our next votes. Um, you know, Monica is going to make a quick change to the polls. So our the next item we'll be voting on. We have um, you know a couple additions to our nominations committee, um, and. Right now, Joe Kramer has been working, um, you know, he's, he's been the primary member of the, the committee as our pa immediate past president. And uh, two, so two new members, Susan Koenig and Dick Goldberg have graciously agreed to join him. Uh, very happy to, to have them on the committee. Um, both Dick and Susan have been members for over 20 years. Um, so know a lot of uh, folks in the congregation and, um, you know, very happy to have uh, more people working in this um, in this important role. So this is so the nominations committee. You know, they focus on 
the uh, you know the the few standing committees that are uh, mandated um, to exist by our bylaws, and and also you know nominations for the board itself. So um, Monica, uh, I guess any and, and and please review the the bios in the in the handout um, for both um, for both Susan and Dick and. Um, there's also our next, coming up next are our youth advisors to the board also. I would say I see there's a second. Thank you. I'm, I'm forgetting to ask for seconds. Thank you to the folks who are seconding the motion in, in the chat function. So thank you, Lorna, for, um, for seconding the motion. So the motion will be to approve these two candidates and we will vote as soon as the poll is ready. All right, can everybody see the second poll is now live? So what you're going to do is select yay, nay, or abstain in the first one, and then in the second, in the third, if you've already already voted, you'll you'll select NA. If you have two members in your household voting right now, the second person can select yay or nay or abstain, um, and so on for the third. Looks like about 90% have voted. It's possible the remaining folks are people calling in. Um, so feel free if you are calling in to vote verbally. All right. Monica, I'm calling in to vote verbally. Yes, on both nominations. Thanks, John. All right, looks like it's slowing down. I see 72 of 86 folks have voted. Okay, I'm gonna end the yeah, poll. We could uh, have participants who aren't members as well, so yeah, it, yeah. Won't, it won't I'm be 100%, yeah. All right, I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing all yays and a few abstentions and lots of NAs. So, all right, uh, the motion carries. Thank you very much, Dick and Susan, for joining our nomination committee. So next up are our youth advisors to the board. Um, we've had youth advisors at our board meetings for um, the last several years. Uh, it's a very valuable addition to the board. Um, they're you know, technically non-voting members, but their perspective is very much valued and uh, you know brings you know, brings interesting perspective and insight to the board. Um, so this year's nominees are Ava, Roche Ava Rochester and Esme Hill Gorman. And both are uh, youth who have come up through our CRE program, been very active in our, in our youth programming for high school age youth. And, uh, you know, again, please take a look at their full bios. Um, we're very happy to have them join our board. Um, so whenever, um, so any any questions? So we'll need a a second to the to the nomination. If someone could second via chat, and then also um, any thank you, Michael, for seconding. If you really want us to read these, we can't see them. They're too small. Right, right. You're not trying to read them on the screen. Um, they're in the. If you. Uh, look at the handouts. Um, the handouts have the agenda and then both sets of bios for the, um, the youth and the, the nominations committee. And sorry for this, we, we would be showing them on the screen, but uh, Monica is making the quick adjustments to the, um, to the polls. Yeah, so the poll is live. Mm -hmm. 
And if the poll does not work on your device, feel free to vote verbally at any point. We only need that um, if you're not able to vote on screen. I approve the nominations, Monica. Thanks, John. Uh, Terry, who moved the uh, nominations on this first? Uh, Michael May. Well, the, no, he seconded. the nomination comes from the board, then Michael May seconded. The last one was Lorna Aronson, and the one before that was Sandy Eskridge. Let go just a few more minutes here. We've got about 75% of the participants voting. All right, again, seeing all the yeas, um, the motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your patience with our interface. <laughs> all right. Um, I know Monica, Monica is doing many things in this meeting, um, so we'll give her give her a second to um, uh, make sure we have a clear record of our votes. And next up in the agenda, whenever you're ready, is the financial update. Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear that? Monica Nolan. I'm we aren't seeing the presentation yet. yet. Monica, are you? Do you have the slides up? Sorry, could you not hear? Could you not hear me? We can hear. Uh, we don't see the the parish meeting deck. Oh, so there was only an intention to see one large video. Can you see that when I share and can you hear? We saw your desktop earlier. Right now we see the FUS logo. And just a moment ago, did you see my face and my voice or no? No. Intriguing. Give me just one second then. Who's <laughs> going to sing a song and do a dance? <laughs> All right, let me give this another go, okay? Um, and feel free to verbalize if you can see it, okay, for about 10 seconds, and then everyone can go quiet again. Huh. There. There you are. Yes. We you see you, Monica. Yes. 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 Be as real can you hear me? Reassuring about our financial landscape. Yay. Yes. Now we can't hear you. Oh, you're muted. You can't mute yourself, Monica. We're Monica, we can't hear you. We have a tremendous amount to be grateful for. How about now? Yes. Let's go back. Wait. And I'll remind you that last fiscal year in February of 2020, we refinanced, re-amortized, and paid down $1 million of our mortgage, bringing the remaining building loan down to just under $3 million. That pay down was obviously thanks to the generosity so many of you extended to the capital campaign back in 2017. And these mortgage moves placed us in a much better position for this year, decreasing our annual payments by $107,000. Now, a bit of a side note, it's interesting um, that the UUA considers a mortgage of 25% or less of your entire annual operating budget to be a reasonable size. So we're at roughly 10%. And Roger recently shared that this will be a very pleasant surprise to most ministerial candidates who may have heard our reputation for being, and I quote, mortgaged up the wazoo. Uh, there are certainly amazing and obvious benefits for minimizing or eliminating one's debt, but I think it's interesting to note that objectively speaking, the impact on our overall budget is considered quote unquote reasonable. Another thing to mention about last year is that we qualified for the Small Business Association's PPP or Paycheck Protection Program loan in the spring of 2020. We received just shy of $200,000. We anticipate that this loan with a 1% interest rate will likely be forgiven, becoming more like a grant than a loan sometime in or before the spring of 2021. 
And with the help of approximately a quarter of the PPP funds, just shy of $50,000, we ended the year with a balanced budget, so zero deficit and zero surplus in our operating fund. In other words, without the PPP funds, we would have ended the year with a $50,000 deficit. We ended the fiscal year with $1.83 million in our operating fund income and expenses, which is about 82K less than projected, which is about a 4% deviation. So moving into this fiscal year, which began July 1st, 2020, you'll recall we had a budget in hand with some loosely held assumptions that we may be able to gather in person again in early 2021. The verdict is still out on that, but seems highly unlikely that will be the case at least in any fiscally significant manner. We committed to you all last spring that we would revisit our budget this fall, which we have done. So together the staff and finance committee created a revised projection for the remainder of the fiscal year, given the new assumption that we will likely be a primarily virtual institution for the remainder of the fiscal year. We propose that rather than officially ratifying our current budget, that we use this new projection as an internal tool that will primarily help guide our spending. We will of course reference these projections in future communications about the budget this year. Given the unique landscape of this year, we project using $93,000 less in operating expenses, bringing anticipated annual expenses closer to the 1.74 million mark. We're projecting $123,000 less in operating income which is just over 1.7 million. So we're currently anticipating using just over $30,000 in PPP funds to end the year without a deficit. Doing so would leave us with around $120,000 left in PPP funds. Currently including those funds and assuming they're forgiven, we have approximately $300,000 in cash reserves. Um, our average monthly expenses are approximately $150,000 per month. So this is about two months worth of savings. Keep in mind that for the last five years, we've incrementally decreased the degree to which we rely on cash reserves. Um, but we have long utilized, utilized budgeted cash transfers in order to balance the budget. So this year, for example, we budgeted using $63,000 of cash reserves, which was down $35,000 from um, $99,000 we used the year prior. So let's assume we continue to use approximately $75,000 of cash reserves for the next few years. Our reserves would be depleted in three and a half years. And given that there's so much uncertainty about what the next few years looks like, both from a public health perspective and in light of our internal ministerial transition, we know that in the next few years, we need to find meaningful ways to either increase income or decrease expenses. And I'll be sure to circle back to that at the end of my time. So in regards to current income, pledge payments remain our largest and most significant source. And you know, if you've been tuned into our finances at all the last few years, that though on average, those that are giving give more year after year, our number of donors has been decreasing in numbers for nearly a decade. This year, so far at least, there does not appear to be an exception to that trend, though I imagine few of anyone would have expected otherwise in the midst of a global pandemic uh, and in the third and final year of a ministerial transition. Currently, pledge commitments are down from last year by about 30 households um, and about $42,000. So to date, we have 542 pledge commitments, totaling $1 million. And given that we budgeted a lower pledge payment amount this year of about $1,109,000, we are about $15,000 closer to our budgeted pledge goal than we were last year at this time. So Roger, Kelly, and I are reaching out personally to all the folks who pledged last year, but haven't yet this year, in hopes of gaining a sense of what's happening in their lives and in their ever-evolving relationship with FUS. Uh, we really hope to gain a better sense of why community members are making different financial decisions. Those 110 households collectively committed just over $124,000 in pledges last year. 
So it's our hope that at least a quarter of these donors will still ultimately decide to make a pledge this year. Uh, in the next two weeks, we'll also reach out to all of our sustaining givers, many of whom are in the room virtually today. Um, you all are the folks that a year and a half ago opted to make multi-year pledges and have been tremendous to FUS in your generosity and your reliability. And as we aim to address a pledge delta, we'd ask that you, pillars of our community, consider making a contribution of $25 more each month for the next six months. Doing so would go a tremendous distance and helping us meet our budgeted pledge payment goal. And obviously we recognize that in light of the pandemic, this is not a viable solution for everyone. We know that there are then those among us whose household have, have been significantly impacted financially by the pandemic. And we honor and encourage you to please know that we are not asking you to give more than you're able. Uh, we also hold true that there are those among us who have lowered our personal expenses during this time and have perhaps even increased income. And if that is true, you may want to step forward to give for those who cannot. We know you'll all do your own discernment around this, but please know that we are always available to discuss either increasing your current giving or listening and supporting you as you experience financial hardships. All right, so back to the first quarter financials, and I promise we're in the home stretch now. Uh, between July 1st and September 30th, we saw both less income and lower expenses than we anticipated. Pledge payments from Q1 in particular were significantly lower than anticipated. We budgeted $238,000, received 190, so we're uh, 44K under our budgeted pledge goal. It appears that the majority of the pledge payment issues we saw in the first quarter are the result of once a year pledge payers holding off on payments in the first quarter. So I suspect this was likely in light of public health, political and economic uncertainties. Uh, I wonder if not having a physical basket to drop pledge checks into um, has delayed pledge payments. We've also heard from numerous members about interim fatigue and their intentions to wait until after the next settled minister is selected to begin financially supporting FUS again or making their pledge payments. It's likely a combination of all of these factors. So for those of you that make your pledge payments once a year, we hope if you're able that you'll consider making those prior to the end of the calendar year or at the beginning of 2021. Um, and for those of you that like to make your monthly pledge payments, please review those contribution statements that we mail to you periodically to ensure your payments align with your giving intentions. So this year is strange, obviously, and it's pushed us as a community to grow in ways we couldn't have imagined. I personally have been deeply inspired by the work that we're doing together. And you'll hear more about that in a moment. Uh, we have a powerful annual strategic plan this year that speaks to the urgent need to address the many forms of systemic oppression perpetuated in the name of sexism and homophobia, but in particular racism. The plan also calls on us to be adaptable in this year of ministerial search and care for each other as we navigate this global crisis and transition. Having a fully funded budget means we can lean into those priorities to the fullest extent possible. And finally, I hope you all believe as fervently as I do that there is cause for financial optimism. It feels important that we recognize that it is not uncommon for congregations to experience significant income bumps with the arrival of a new minister. I hope you all are as excited as I am to welcome this new person and create a relationship that brings even greater energy and vision to our community. Uh, when we chat again virtually about finances, it will likely be on May 23rd at the Financial Forum. Please mark your calendars. In the meantime, I hope you'll keep a lookout in newsletters and red floors for periodic financial updates. Uh, and of course, don't hesitate to reach out to me directly if you have any questions. Uh, all right, so I will hand uh, things over to Kelly and Terry to discuss the annual strategic priorities. And Monica, I think there were just a couple questions um, that might be good to address now. 
Um, uh, question about deadline to use the CARES Act money. Um, are, does that carry over into 2021? No, so the CARES Act the CARES money has all been utilized already. So okay. we, yeah, the, the application for forgiveness should go in in the next month. We should know about the answer to that in six months though. Okay, all right. Um, and just in general, um, please reach out to Monica directly if anyone would like to see the video that wasn't able to hear it well on, on their device. Um, we're, um, I, I was able to hear it okay. Uh, hope, hope everyone was able to, to, to hear the gist of it. So, so thank you very much, Monica. We will, um, whenever you're ready, if we could share, uh, were there any other questions? I think we, uh, okay. Um, whenever you're ready, if we could share, go back to the presentation uh, to the strategic, strategic planning slide. All right. Okay, so I just want to um, make a few notes about um, the process and intent of this year's strategic priority statement. Um, so for the past several years, uh, the board has been focused on um, kind of creating and refining repeatable processes related to governance. And uh, we've had a few um, goals related to this. Um, first, we were, you know, uh, working on improving continuity from year to year, um, kind of uh, keeping things going in the um, in the way that's intended by our governance model, and you know, kind of more fully living out um, the processes um, put in place. Um, so another, so one of our main goals in creating this um, this priority statement is uh, simplicity. Uh, we're looking for something concise so that uh, the priorities are easy to share and communicate throughout the congregation. Um, so just a single slide, you know, this is it. This isn't a summary. This is the, you know, this is the um, strategic priorities document. Um, and also um, behind the scenes, we've been, you know, working on keeping the open question conversations going throughout the year. Um, so not, you know, this is, the, our parish meeting discussions, you know, it's one primary place where that happens. Um, but, you know, our model really calls for this to be a year long activity. Um, one thing we've been doing internal to the board is just reserving more of our meeting time um, to focus on open questions. Um, the question we're going to talk about today, um, we actually took time during our board meeting you know, to kind of walk through the question just as a group, just as a small group would do today. Um, you know, I, and that's, um, you know, that's just one piece of things, you know, the intent is to um, keep, you know, create many opportunities throughout the year to keep these conversations going. Um, so just a few notes about the, um, the, the questions it's themselves. Um, or sorry, the statements themselves. Um, so because of this unique transition time that we're in, um, this statement is in, intended to primarily guide this year, so the 2020-2021 program year. And it will continue as long as it's needed uh, when the new ministry team is in place next year. The first item, um, nurturing a strong sense of community through the pandemic, um, taking care of ourselves and one another with love. Uh, there was, you know, a, just a sense of urgency and necessity, um, you know, just at FUS as everywhere else. Um, it is, it you know, just has to be a top priority to uh, continuously adapt to the evolving public health crisis. The second item, dismantling systems of oppression, particularly racism. Um, the intent in placing this in our top priorities is um, intended to communicate that you know, we want to focus on this at all levels in all areas of our operations and programming. So it's not just for one particular group or, um, or ministry team, you know, but it's, uh, you know, we want to look at this in all of our um, policies and practices and, um, and our, our programming. 
And again, unique to this particular year, um, you know, we need to practice adaptability, supporting our search team and engaging in the process as FUS searches for a new minister to join Reverend Kelly Crocker next fall. Um, so as, as with many things we're doing, um, that is, you know, our search and, um, uh, and, and transition as, a, um, as an FUS community is, is top of mind. Uh, so the intent of sharing and creating this document is, um, is intended to help enable everyone involved with the FES community, so staff, members, and congregation, um, to focus on a limited number of top priorities and to help in decision making around um, you know, where, where to put time and energy and to say you know, yes or no when individual ideas or programming um, topics come up. Um, and I, uh, next thing, Kelly is going to just say a few words about, um, about how this is playing out for the, for the staff in, um, in helping prioritize um, time. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, so we brought these to the staff and primarily what we're hoping and what we're hearing from staff just over the course of the past few weeks we would like them to use these to prioritize their work, to think about what it is that they do and uh, to really see that work in light of these strategic priorities. So what fits, what doesn't fit, right? Especially our operational staff, we were really clear with them that putting your work into strategic priorities is easier for programmatic staff, right? We can think about the small groups and the worship and the things that we're doing to nurture community. And then um, facility staff might say, where do we fit in here? And Monica is doing a fantastic job in working with operational staff in seeing where their work does indeed fit into these strategic priorities. The other piece of that besides helping them figure out how to prioritize their time and efforts is also being able to say no. And this is one of the hardest things that our staff has to do. If someone comes with this great new idea that they're so passionate about and it doesn't fit into these priorities, learning how to say, this may not be the year that we've got staff time to work on this. It's not saying that it can't happen if there's enough members that wanna see this happen, we can talk about it. But being able to use these to say no, which is so difficult. And so we wanted to name that today on behalf of staff and really ask you all for a lot of grace if and when that happens to understand where it's coming from, that it is not coming from a place of a value judgment around your idea, it's coming from a place of wanting to uh, hold and honor and respect the amount of time that our staff has. So thank you for that. Thank you, Kelly. Um, all right, um, so moving on to our next presentation, um, President-elect Alyssa Ryan Joy and Roger Burstausen are going to say a few words about the ministerial model. Thanks, Jerry. Um, so I am incredibly excited to share an update to our term ministerial model that was outlined in the ministerial search update sent this week. Um, if you haven't read read the article there, there's more details, so please Please, re please reference that if you if you haven't. Um, but it, first of all, just wanted to say a, a huge thanks to all who participated in this effort. Um, the Ministerial Research Task Force, um, huge round of applause for them. They've uh, they did an amazing job of reaching out to other congregations and also doing a ton of research on uh, what kind of models exist and what are the benefits and drawbacks of them. Um, also, shout out of course to the search committee. And everyone, all of you who, are, who participated in cottage meetings, um, open question discussions, and surveys as well. 
So I'm, I'm really proud to be part of a congregation that really leaned into our fourth principle um, and has engaged in a free and responsible search for truth and meaning um, to bring forward the benefits and drawbacks of different ministerial models. It's really neat to see. So in, in previous times of transition at FUS, there were far fewer examples of success with, with less hierarchy and organizational structure. Um, UU congregations that had more than one minister almost always had one senior minister with more authority. And while we know more now about the advantages of, of maybe a more collaborative structure, most of us also joined FUS while Reverends Michael Schuler or Max Gabler were senior ministers and, and we found our spiritual homes here. So we continue to treasure uh, the incredible leadership that, that both of them brought to us over the years. And, and I personally feel that FUS that most certainly didn't have an inadequate model of ministry in the past. And we also find ourselves now in a time of transition with a number of truths that have pointed us to new possibilities. So first calling a new minister provides a opportunity to um, organically change our organizational structure. Reverend Kelly Crocker has served our congregation for almost 20 years and we're so blessed that she wants to carry her experience into this new chapter at FUS. There are more examples of large UU congregations that have successfully implemented more collaborative models of co-ministry. Research and anti-oppression work has enlightened us to how systems of hierarchy don't always allow women and other non-dominant groups to thrive in their professional lives. And we've seen more evidence throughout society that collaboration provides flexibility, encourages creativity, and enables people to work to their individual strengths. And most importantly, uh, our majority of our congregants have told us that they find value in a more collaborative and less hierarchical model at this moment um, in our congregational evolution. So considering all of these things, uh, we're using this time of transition to build a ministry of equal standing. So that means that our new called minister will have the same level of responsibility and authority to Reverend Kelly. While the ministers will have extensive collaboration and a lot of freedom to divide up the work according to their own skills and passions, each are also uh, going to have distinct areas of responsibility too with robust accountability to the board. And to ensure that, and uh, once the new minister is settled, a written covenant will be developed by Kelly and the new minister along with the board to define this and will be shared out with the congregation. So we'll be able to see what areas of ministry each minister um, is accountable for. The board is uh, very enthusiastic about this direction. We hope you're excited to engage with our ministers in this new model that allows us to more fully live into our UU values. And if you do feel some discomfort or uncertainty with this change, that's okay too. Um, we hope that everyone is open to learning and adapting and growing so that together we can continue to build um, a loving community that, that seeks to, to do what we do, do good in the world. So with that, I wanna um, just take a few minutes to answer any questions from the chat. Um, as Terry said, if you're called into this meeting um, and can't chat in questions, feel free to speak up. And again, we, we if, if we don't get to your questions during the meeting today, um, we'll be sure to save the chat and answer any questions in a written communication. I'm looking back here, if there's anything that's come up. It looks like not at the moment. So I will transition over then to an update from the search committee with Emily and Sandy. All right. Uh, so for those who may not know me, my name is Emily Smith. And today I will be representing the seven members of the search committee. Um, we wanted to take just a few minutes today to share with you the work that we've done so far, kind of a brief summary of that, as well as what we've learned through doing that work and what to expect from us next. So first, just a really brief overview of what we've been doing in the last few months. 
I'm not going to go into detail on any of these activities because we've written several newsletter articles and there's information on our search webpage where you can you can find out more about this. Um, but just to, to run through it briefly, in September, we conducted a congregational survey. In October, we hosted several cottage meetings and focus groups, various small group discussions with members of the congregation. In November, we did a few things. Um, we wrote our congregational record, which is how ministers will learn about our congregation and the job opportunity here. We hosted the Beyond Categorical Thinking Workshop with Reverend Keith Crone from the UUA. Our negotiating team drafted our ministry agreement, which is the employment contract that our new minister um, will be taking on. And finally, we put together our document packet, which is basically just a lot of supplemental information to that congregational record, a lot of um, examples of uh, documents that exist throughout our congregation, things like our bylaws and past parish meeting minutes, as well as several other things. So if you do have any questions about that, about those activities, we're trying to save a few minutes at the end for any questions you might have. But for now, I will move on to thanking all of the volunteers who have helped us do this work. If we go back just one slide briefly. Um, so to shout everyone out briefly, Lorna, Roz, Lois, Ann, and Cricket helped us make calls to get people engaged with the congregational survey. Uh, Rini, Harry, Dick, and Dave helped us conduct those cottage meetings and focus groups, mostly by taking notes uh, and a couple times by facilitating those meetings themselves. Um, and I forgot to put his name on the slide, but Michael May has also been helping us out a lot the last month or so um, as part of the negotiating team, so drafting that ministry agreement. Um, and we also want to give a shout out to all of our supportive staff, in particular Monica, who has really kind of quarterbacked all of the requests that we've made of staff and has been really patient with our multiple requests and competing deadlines um, and really helpful and responsive in getting that all done. Um, Roger has attended many of our search committee meetings and offered some excellent advice um, and was willing to uh, help us edit our congregational record, which involved reading through uh, tens of pages of information. So we really appreciate that as well. Um, and to, to Brittany, who has helped us communicate much of the information that we've communicated to you by helping us update our webpage and put together newsletter articles and all of that fun stuff. And I, I know that all of the other staff members have helped us out as well, in particular with helping us get together that document packet. So a big thank you to everyone. Uh, but moving on to what we've learned, which is really what we've heard from the congregation as we've talked with you over these last few months. Um, we've heard a lot and we have valued all of it. And if you're looking for a pretty detailed summary of what we've heard, I would encourage you to check out the search committee's webpage where we have a summary document of comments that were left um, in response to questions on the congregational survey, as well as a summary document of the comments that we heard during cottage meetings and focus groups. Um, but today, what I would like to read to you is just kind of eight big themes that we heard most frequently. So that is what is on the slide and I will read to you now. So first, we seek unity and a common purpose. Our large congregation can feel fragmented and siloed. We'd like to break down those silos to work more collaboratively together. We know that many among us prefer intellectual sermons, many prefer emotional or spiritual sermons, and many like both. We refer to this as head versus heart, and we hope our new minister will help us balance both of these perspectives. This is a welcoming community. It can also be difficult to develop a deep sense of belonging here. One person summarized this by saying, FUS is a welcoming place where it's hard to find a friend. We're conscious that the demographics of our congregation are primarily white, highly educated, and skew older. That being said, survey results show us that some members of our congregation do not fit these categories, and we want to make space for all when we define ourselves. If we go to the next slide. We're very proud of our strong music and CRE programs. We're committed to social justice, especially environmental and racial justice. 
and we'd like to engage more with our broader Madison community in these areas. We're aware that a consumerist mindset is prevalent in our congregation. We'd like to see our congregation continue to grow in membership, engagement, and financial contributions. And finally, we love and value our staff and Reverend Kelly. We'd like to see our new minister work collaboratively with the existing team. So like I said, there's a lot more detail to what we heard and there's more, more nuance to any one of those points. Uh, and if you would like to read about that, do check out our webpage. Um, but we think in these big themes that I just read to you, there's a pretty good balance of things that we currently do well and we're really proud of um, and areas where we'd like to grow and maybe we have some goals and aspirations. Um, when the search committee starts interviewing ministers in January, we'll look for someone who shares many of these aspirations with us and has skills to help us move towards them. Uh, but we also wanna offer a reminder that realizing these goals and aspirations is the work of a community. Whomever becomes our next minister will be part of the community that works towards those goals and aspirations. Uh, but no single person is going to do that on their own, which is why we have each other. So we're really excited to continue working with all of you towards those goals. Um, and finally, what's next? So the search committee is going to try really hard to take the rest of December off. Um, there's been a lot of work the last few months and we've, uh, we're really gonna try to give ourselves a break for a few weeks because in January, uh, January 2nd is when names of interested ministers will be released to us and the interview process will kick off in earnest. Um, in February and March, we'll hold pre-candidating weekends with three of our top candidates who, we, um, who will be referred to as pre-candidates. Those weekends will in all likelihood be virtual. Um, likely sometime in April is when we will be able to announce to you who our final candidate is. And then likely in late April or early May, we'll have candidating week, which is when that person will be introduced to our congregation. Um, and at the end of candidating week, we will hold a vote on whether to call that person as our next minister or not. So that's what we've got on our docket. I do wanna mention that um, as we're working through the interview process, so really from January 2nd, when we get names through in April, when we're able to announce a candidate to you, um, we're not allowed to tell you anything about the ministers that we're interviewing, just for the sake of maintaining their confidentiality. Um, they, if there are a lot of reasons why that could be important, just one of them to mention is that if a minister is currently serving a congregation, they may not have told that congregation, their congregation that they're in search yet. Um, so for that reason, we're just, we're not allowed to share any identifying information about ministers. So January through March, we might be quieter um, than we've been the last few months. We, not, we just won't have as much to communicate with you. Um, but know that everything you've shared with us over these last few months is informing those interviews um, and we really appreciate and value it. And we look forward to sharing a candidate with you in April. So with that, are there any questions that have come in via chat? Yeah, thank you again to all the work the search committee is doing. Um, I, I don't know how clear it is from the um, you know from the summary, but you know the the many many hours of work go into this, and it is what is expected of congregations. It's uh, um, there's a lot that happens that's preparatory work. It it is unlike any other hiring process that I'm aware of. It is it is extensive. It is really an examination of, of our entire community and who we want to be in the future. Um, thank you very much to each member of the search committee and everyone who has helped. And I see Roger saying in the chat, FUS is lucky to have this group of people leading the ministerial search. Um, I agree, thank you, thank you very much. Um, and we do need to, um, we will continue to monitor the questions in chat. Um, we are just barely on track to have um, our plans time for the, um, for the open question. All right, thank you again, Emily. All right, so very briefly, just, uh, you know, kind of, uh, we're kind of using jargon every time we say the word open question. Um, so the open question is, you know, just like the term sounds, it is intended to be 
a you know a very open discussion. The 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 discussion the open question is intended to um, you know elicit long term thinking you know creative thinking that will guide our congregation in the years to come. Um, it is you know kind of it is kind of directed toward the board. It is intended to. Um, guide the board, all of the board's work as the, um, you know, the governing body of the congregation. Um, it's intended to carry on throughout the year, so not just this discussion today. Um, and, you know, over time, it, you know, it informs, you know, all of the strategic choices that we make. So this is just, you know, just one point of input, but it is a, it is a format that is, um, that is at the center of our governance structure. Will we go on to the next slide, please? All right. So the topic today, um, you know, again, we're using some terminology that we want to make sure um, people are a little bit familiar with. Um, we are, we're focusing on the concept of centering people of color. And uh, we have a working definition that uh, Lorna Aronson found for us on a uh, a blog um, uh, put out by some activists. Uh, it's called the Fake Equity Blog. And uh, the, the definition they put out there is centering people of color is about shifting power, control, and well being or comfort to people of color. And, uh, you know, if you'd like to read more about that, there's a, there's a little bit longer blog post on that website. The link is, is below and in the handouts. So the question we would like to consider today is what would it look like for FUS to center people of color? And we are you know, going to you know, move into this discussion in small groups. And uh, you know, I know the, you know, the, the Zoom format is very Im impersonal, so we really want to focus on um, giving people ample time to discuss in the small groups. Um, so this, you know, the small groups themselves will, um, you know, will constitute the, the majority of the, the meeting. Um, we'd like to, uh, so each group will be facilitated by either a board member, uh, one of our members, uh, sorry, one of our ministers, or a member of the racial justice team. So, um, so the facilitators will help with this as well, but, you know, but please, you know, please focus on um, making sure everyone has a chance to speak and, um, and really, you know, you know, doing some deep listening on this topic. And the facilitators, um, you know, will, will provide a little bit more information about that. And uh, so we do, we do want to kind of, um, you know, it's intended to be a full discussion amongst the small group, um, you know, just, you know, for time and format considerations, we're not going to try to, to summarize or synthesize to, to bring back to the full group. Uh, the facilitators will be taking notes um, and that's intended to be the record of the, con uh, of the conversations. So, um, so the board will take that and, and we can, you know, share that in writing and in future conversations. But today, um, you know, we will conclude within the, within the small groups themselves. Um, all right. So let's uh, move okay. into the, sorry, go ahead. I'm sending you on. Yeah, so we'll be in small groups for 20 minutes. Oh, Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for having that conversation. We look forward to seeing the notes from the facilitators, and we're grateful that you stuck with it today. I think what we have left is Roger. I think that's right. So my thanks to Terry and all the presenters, everybody who, who made this work today, Monica, all the behind the scenes in 18 different ways at the same time. Um, thank you to all of you who, are, who came to this. This is, you know, not how we're used to doing parish meetings. It's different, it's challenging, and I'm grateful that you came and participated. And please do follow up with any person you heard from. If you have questions, ideas, thoughts, we'd love to, love to, love to hear from you. So for closing words, I've got a, one of my favorite closing readings from our hymnal that comes from Barbara Peskin. And to me, it's just a beautiful statement about um, our past, 
present, and future, and how we're all human. Because of those who came before, we are. In spite of their failings, we believe. Because of and in spite of the horizons of their vision, we too dream. So let us go remembering to praise, to live in the moment, to love mightily, and to bow to the mystery. May each one of you go in peace this day and keep on staying engaged with this amazing congregation. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Enjoy the day. Bye. So good to Thank see you. you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Karen Rose. Bye, you. bye Kelly. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye. 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 bye Emily. Bye-bye. Nice to see you. Good to see you, too. <laughs>